Well, that was unexpected. Apparently my house is now infested with zombies. You know, I thought that smell was the trash. Okay, that's not true. But hey, it does sort of fit in with today's subject. Now, I already discussed the history of Resident Evil when I reviewed one of the books, so... God, it's been nearly three years. I know, I know. Where the hell are those other reviews I keep talking about, right? Well, here's the thing, and I'm sorry if you were expecting it, but I've decided not to do them, because many of those books are novelizations of the games. Doing the books would just come off as redundant since I'm doing some of the games anyway. And so we begin with the 2002 GameCube remake of the first Resident Evil game, which just recently saw an HD release on the PlayStation Network. Yes, this game was a remake of the 1996 game that launched the series and coined the term survival horror. Though technically Resident Evil wasn't the first survival horror game. No, that honor belongs to the first Alone in the Dark. Makes sense considering that game was based off of the stories of H.P. Lovecraft. Speaking of stories, there are two stories in this game, both similar yet at the same time different from each other. At the start of the game, you can choose to play as one of two characters. Fan favorite Joe Valentine or Chris Redfield back before he was punching boulders. I am a man! I'm going to show off Jill's scenario first. She's generally considered the easy mode of the game as she can hold more items and actually starts off with a gun. We'll talk about that later. Sometime after Star's Bravo team heads off to find the supposed cannibal killers, Alpha team heads out for support because Bravo's helicopter went down. Alpha team finds the wreckage in the pilot who's been severely mutilated. As they're looking for clues, they find out why as one of the team members, Joseph Frost, gets chewed on by some zombie dogs. The survivors, Jill, Barry Burton, and team leader Albert Wesker, head into the nearby mansion with Chris having gone in my A. As the three of them catch their breath, a noise gets their attention. Jill and Barry go to the nearby dining hall to investigate, and while exploring a nearby hallway, Jill finds a zombie chewing on the corpse of Bravo team member Kenneth Sullivan. Jokes aside, this is our first true glimpse that there is something seriously fucked up going on. Jill and Barry more or less say that, it's paraphrased of course, after Barry puts the thing down. They decide to report this to Wesker, who has also decided to disappear. What, do you have to take a bathroom break or something? Well, after looking around the entrance hall, Jill and Barry decide to split up and look for everyone. Barry even gives Jill her old lockpick. Anyway, from here the story sort of thins out. Most of the time it's just you running through the house, avoiding or killing any zombies in your path with your trusty weapon, but and I should probably save this one I discuss the gameplay, but screw it, my video, my rules. You can't go crazy like you can in the most recent installments. You are a small group of elite police officers, but because your pilot bailed out on you, he took most of your weapons and ammo with him. That means that unless you plan on doing an all-knife run, I don't know why you would, the knife in this game sucks more than the Pittsburgh Steelers, you need to save your ammo for when you really need it. I'll continue this discussion when I get to the gameplay. The majority of the story is told in a similar manner to the story in Metroid Prime through files, diaries, memos, letters, and photographs that you can pick up. Each of them is told from the point of view of someone who worked in the mansion, which, as we later discover, is the hiding place for one of the Umbrella Corporation's many laboratories, and discusses what went down, what with the T-Virus breaking out and all that. One of the earliest you find, and probably the most famous, actually has the writer describe what it feels like to be turned into a zombie before said zombie comes out of the closet to attack you. No, he's not coming out like that. While the story does thin out, the objective remains the same. Find Bravo Team, find Chris and Wesker, and get the fuck out of there. The only problem is, most of Bravo Team is dead. Look at Kenneth who has an next on so much that his head fell off. And this is shown in pretty disturbing detail when you watch the tape you pull off of him, and Forrest who was pecked to death by the T-Virus infected crows. Though Forrest does give you a grenade launcher. Jill crosses paths with Barry from time to time, but after the second meeting he's acting a little odd. He tells Gil that he's just feeling a little stressed out, and you know what? I believe him. I'd be a little proud of myself if I were in this situation, assuming I didn't get chewed on. She'll also find Richard Aiken, another member of Bravo Team, but he's been poisoned. After giving him an antidote, he tells her that he was bitten by a big snake that just happens to be guarding a trinket Jill needs. Richard tries to help Jill with the snake, but just gets eaten for his trouble. And now I'm thinking healing him was a big waste of time. That trinket was one of the things needed to access another part of the mansion grounds, the gardens where Jill encounters this thing. This is actually Lisa Trevor, the daughter of George Trevor, one of the founders of the Umbrella Corporation. And she was one of the first experiments with the T-Virus and the Nemesis Parasite, which I'll discuss later in this marathon. Want to know how to fight this thing? You don't. You just run. Jill will eventually find her way to the underground caverns that lead to the lab. 
Here she encounters Bravo team leader Enrico Marini, who tells her that there's a mole in the stars. Before he can give a name, someone shoots him from off screen. She finds Barry and later holds him at gunpoint with his own gun, basically forcing him to confess. She knows that he's hiding something, and she wants to know what. Before Barry can say anything, Lisa attacks. Jill and Barry manage to throw her down a shaft, finally defeating her. Bye. And giving them a straight shot to the labs where they meet Wesker. And for those of you who are new to this series, Wesker was the mole Enrico was talking about. What a twist! Wesker was on Umbrella's payroll this entire time. He was basically using the stars as a means to test Umbrella's new bioweapons created by the T-Virus. The reason Barry was acting so weird was because Wesker told him that he had his family being held hostage, and if Barry didn't do as Wesker wanted, basically leave the surviving stars members to their deaths, he would kill them. He made that whole thing up just to get Barry to cooperate, but it doesn't matter to Wesker because he succeeded in his mission, now Umbrella's going to... Barry knocks Wesker, and then Jill and Barry notice the crown jewel of the Umbrella Corporation. The Tyrant. They drain the fluids in the tank, thinking it's life support fluid, and hoping to kill the thing. But then just wakes it up and makes it angry. And the first thing it does is shank Wesker. Jill and Barry escape the lab and bump into Chris, who tells them that the entire place is set to blow up here in a few minutes. Fortunately, Jill has a handy dandy radio, and it's called the pilot to come pick them up at the nearby hell pad. Hopefully nothing will get in the way of... Well, shit. Gotta fight this asshole, don't I? Okay! Hope you guys saved up your ammunition and healing supplies, because this son of a bitch takes one hell of a beating. After a while, the pilot will toss Jill a rocket launcher, which she uses to blow the bastard into bite-sized pieces. The survivors climb into the helicopter and take off, just as the mansion goes curved to Louie. Our heroes ride off into the sunrise, and a whole slew of sequels, spin-offs, and steroid abuse. And now we move on to Chris's story, which is actually very similar to Jill's story. The only difference is that Chris is hanging around with Rebecca, because this time it's Barry who's gone MIA. Yeah, in either story, you never encounter one of the characters. For Jill, it's Rebecca, and for Chris, it's Barry. Anyway, Chris is often considered the more difficult mode of the game. He may take more of a beating than Jill, but he can't carry as many items, he can't run as fast, he doesn't even start out with a gun, he finds Jill's gun later on after she and Wesker disappear. The enemies are a bit tougher, and he can't play piano. That lack of a skill actually ties into one of the many puzzles this game has to offer, but since I'm still on the story part of this review, that can wait. Actually, we can do that right now, because as I said, Chris's story is very similar to Jill's story. So how about that gameplay? Well, let's start with the usual, movement. You move with the D-pad or the left analog stick. But contrary to what you might believe in most 3D games, this game operates on tank controls. What does that mean? Simple. If you hold up on the D-pad, you move forward. Hold back, you move backward, and holding left or right makes your character turn in that direction. You can run by holding up and the square button, or you can just hold the left analog stick, thus negating the horrible tank controls. The R1 button raises your current weapon, and the X button uses it. Like I said earlier, stick with the firearms, because a knife is useless, at least to me. Pressing the circle button brings up the status screen. Displayed here is the current health, which ranges from fine to yellow caution to orange caution to red with the occasional poison. The character's side item, lockpick for Jill and the lighter for Chris. The defensive weapon, dagger and tasers for Jill, and daggers and flash grenades for Chris. As well as the character's inventory. You can also view any files you picked up in case you feel like getting in some light reading, or need a clue to a puzzle. And you can also view the mask while you're here. Unless you pick up the mask loaded throughout the mansion, they'll fill in as you go. If a zombie latches onto you, and your character has any defensive weapons on them, they'll use it to knock the zombie back. Don't have any defensive weapons? Then say goodbye to a big chunk of flesh and health. They always say the best way to kill a zombie is to shoot it in the head. And sometimes if you do that with a shotgun or you get really lucky with a standard handgun, you'll blow their heads into delicious red chunks. Kinda makes me hungry for meatloaf. But there's more than just zombies to contend with in this game. There's zombies, zombie dogs, angry birds, giant spiders, the giant snakes, giant sharks, high megalodon, bees. Bees. My god. Those are like creatures called hunters, which have a decapitation movie. Yes, it's an instant kill, so watch out. These fly like creatures called chimeras, Lisa Trevor, who hounds you after you meet her in the garden shed. And finally, the Tyrant. Once you kill an enemy and leave the room, you can come back and see that the body has disappeared. At least this place isn't littered with... Wait, why is that zombie still there? I could have sworn I... Wait, why is it... Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh god, no, 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 Jesus Christ, Superstar, help me! 
If you don't destroy the zombie's head, they'll come back as a creature known as a crimson head, which are actually the second stage of the evolutionary process of a zombie. Zombie to crimson head to liquor. Yes, they turn zombies into fucking Pokemon. The only way to prevent this are to get in a lucky headshot or burn the zombies with kerosene and a lighter. But there's only so much kerosene, so keep in mind what I said about conserving your ammo, because these motherfuckers not only know how to take a beating, but they deliver the beating as well, and god damn do they. As I said earlier, this game is littered with all sorts of puzzles your character needs to complete in order to continue. Some are pretty simple and can be solved in a few moments, but others can take half the game to complete. Let's look at a simple one, and it's one of the earliest. You come into this room and see a shotgun hang on, hanging on the wall. You think, SCORE, and you take it. The bars go up, and you hear a click. Go out into the adjacent room, and the roof starts lowering. How do you solve this? Go into another room in a nearby hallway, pick up a buck and shotgun, and swap the two out. Easy as that. That piano puzzle requires you to find the completed music notes to play a piano to open a secret passage in the wall. By the way, the song is Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Pretty calming piece for such a tense situation. Joe can play it no problem. Since Chris can't play a piano, he has Rebecca do it while he goes running around. The extra weapons are also littered throughout the house. Depending on who you're playing as, you'll always begin with a handgun and a knife, or just a knife if you're Chris, but along the way you'll find a shotgun, a grenade launcher, Jill only, a flamethrower, that kids love this one. And wait, is that a magnum? Holy shit, that's a magnum! Gimme 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 Shoot up the 1812 over return because we were about to blow some minds. Something I probably should have brought up in the beginning of this review was the atmosphere. To hell with Five Nights at Freddy's. This game makes me shit my pants with fear. The lighting, the camera angles, the ambient sounds and music, it all adds up to make one hell of a terrifying experience. The lighting ranges from dim to dark as fuck, which is in dark contrast to the original, where everything was so bright it sort of lessened the mood. The camera angles have always been a staple of the classic series, and you never know what's waiting for you when the camera shifts. Could it be nothing? Could it be that one zombie waiting to chew on your jugular vein? Same applies for the doors, which are actually meant to match the loading screens, and I cannot stress this enough. Learn how to manage your items. There's only so much ammunition, healing items, and kerosene in this game. You have to know when to fight and when to run. This is a pretty great game. What it really excels at is atmosphere. Other than Slender the Arrival, I've never felt more tense while playing a game. The original game back in 1996 actually had people sleeping with nightlights and one eye open just in case a zombie came into their room. But the original was tame compared to this. If you have a GameCube, go ahead and pick it up at your local GameStop or Retro game, game Store. But if not, the game is on the PlayStation Network for about 15 bucks, and I think it's money well spent. This is just the beginning of our dive into the world of survival horror, so next time we meet we'll take a look at one of the greatest games on the PlayStation 1, and what many consider to be the best game in the classic series, Resident Evil 2. See you next time.
Eat a dick, you fucking muppet. Ah, get off, 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 get off.